What do you do when you feel like everything in your life is going wrong? How do you find a way to be reminded that you're right with God even when things are going wrong? Rather than thinking about, well, if everything's going wrong, something must be wrong with me. In many ways, that's what the writer of Hebrews is addressing. You see, the, the issue for the writer of Hebrews was is that everything was going wrong. These were believing Hebrews who had converted to the faith. But because of the intensity of the persecution that they were receiving, were sorely tempted to go back to Judaism where it was safe. Some, in other words, everything's going wrong. Something must be wrong with me. Therefore, I need to do something. You and I know that that's not always the case. That if God is the Lord of all, that we can be in places where the circumstances are really awful. And know that our job is not to do anything but to try to find a way to be faithful. There's no quid pro quo happening. I've done bad things, and therefore bad things are coming back at me. That can, of course, be the case. But what I want to do is get at something different, because sometimes difficult circumstances happen to us, and there is no cause and effect in terms of our behavior or the things that we may or may not have done. But we're so prone to think that way that more often than not, that's where we go, and therefore how we perceive things as God as the divine judge who is meeting out some kind of retribution based on our bad behavior. That can throw you into horrible places of condemnation that really are not a part of our inheritance in Christ Jesus. Because remember, the role of the evil one is to be, how does, what does Jesus call him? The accuser of the brethren. And therefore, the enemy would like nothing better than in the midst of difficult circumstances to weasel in and say, see, it really is all your fault. What the writer of Hebrews is trying to do in the midst of those difficult circumstances is say, look at the things in your life that have not changed, that in fact are eternally true for you. And think about your life from that vantage point. And therefore, he gives a rather extraordinary list. And the way he lays the list out is that he contrasts the giving of the law on Mount Sinai and all that happened there. And he's quoting again and again and again Deuteronomy and the other books that describe that event. And what it is that we have received in Christ. And notice what we have received. Not what we're going to receive, but what we have received in Christ. And he begins specifically with the past passive voice. You have not come, notice, to something that, and here's what he's describing in Mount Zion, something that can be touched, a blazing fire, darkness, gloom, the sound of a trumpet, a voice whose words made the hearers beg that nothing else be spoken to them. Because that's exactly what it was like. Remember when Moses comes, you know, the fire of God comes down on Sinai and they're all terrified, the prohibition is given, and the writer quotes this. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death, much less a human being. In other words, and in fact, to have stepped on Sinai while the manifest presence of God was there, you couldn't even go and rescue the people at that point. You had to literally kill them either by stone or by javelin. In other words, you couldn't get close because then the same thing was going to happen to you. No wonder you see they're so terrified. Even in quoting Moses, even says, I tremble with fear. There are plenty of people that understand their relationship with God exactly from that perspective. Here's the law, and let me tell you, if you transgress, it's curtains for you. Again, that's that same kind of understanding of divine retribution, retribution that the enemy would like nothing better than to sort of weasel in 
and cause you to think that in the midst of all of these circumstances, guess who's at the center of the universe? It's me and my bad behavior. Can you see how myopic that is? We're never the center of the universe. Ever. But instead, he gives, here's the contrasting list. But you have come to Mount Zion, not Sinai. What's the biblical reference? Zion was the place that King David established where the Ark of the Covenant dwelt. That's its origins. In other words, you have come, again, notice, not you will, but you have. You have come to the meeting place between God and humanity. That is, in fact, yours. To the city of the living, not the dead, notice, the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. <coughs> In other words, even though there is not for us the capacity to see the physical mountain of Sinai, who needs it if that's our inheritance? Instead, we're a part of something that is cosmic and filled, that fills eternity and time, where they come together. You, this is what is now yours. Where what? The heavenly Jerusalem to innumerable angels in festal gathering. In other words, you've come literally to a divine party and you get to be included. To the assembly of the firstborn. Guess who gets invited there? Those who have the inheritance of God. And that's you. And to God, the judge of all, and yet he's the one who's called a party. How is he able to do that? Because who else is there? It is to Jesus, God in the flesh, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkling of blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. It is the blood of Abel that cried out from the ground in revenge for killing. That voice is no more. In other words, what is your posture even in the midst of difficult? Where, where are you geographically located in the spiritual realm in the midst of even the difficult circumstances in which you find yourself? Well, where are we? Well, we're actually in the midst of a celebration where we are fully and completely included, where there is, in fact, no condemnation because the blood of Abel has been silenced. And who has invited us in is the God and judge of all. In other words, there's no kind of, here's big bad judge God over here, and here's night sweet, night sweet, sweet Jesus over here. But rather, <laughs> what we have here is the entire Godhead collected with angels, archangels, all the company of heaven, all of us who are in fact in Christ, fully and completely knowing that not only is this where I belong, but this is where I have been sovereignly placed by the very blood of Jesus. Therefore, guess where I am? And this is where I remain. So the question is, in the midst of difficulty you, that you face, who and what reminds you that this is what is eternally true for you? regardless of what's happening in terms of your circumstances. The, the, the audience of Hebrews had, in fact, lost sight of that. And therefore, they understood that the better place of safety was not this newfound faith, which was only yielding for them persecution, as they saw it. But instead, they wanted to go back to the safety of, Ju of Judaism. And the writer said, why in the name of God would you ever want to go? It is so much worse. And the word is to us, why would you ever want to go back to any kind of understanding of faith that is based on some kind of quid pro quo retribution where you're the center of the universe and all of the problems that are happening is because you've made bad choices? Holy smokes. <laughs> what I would want to encourage you to is, first of all, what this passage says is eternally true for you if you are in Christ. And that does not change. You are under the blood of Jesus, not the blood of Abel. Put it in shorthand. But also, and this is true to the context of the Hebrews 12, the writer is saying, you need to be in doing this for each other. In 
In other words, it's not just, yeah, I need to be reminded. But the call of the passage is to be an encourager. To be the one who goes to other people and say, I know it's awful right now, but look at what is in fact eternally true for you and does not change regardless of your circumstances. Because the whole thrust of the passage is about let us, let us, let us. So it's not just, yeah, this is true for me. Oh, thank God I needed that. But it is as true as it is. But it's also the call to say, yes, I want to be that kind of person that speaks those words of grace and encouragement to other people. Because it's not just true for me. It's true for us. Amen. Amen. Amen.